This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 76. Coming up on Space Time, Japan lands on the asteroid Ryugu, the mysterious pyramid on the dwarf planet Ceres, and it's all systems go for Europe's first mission to the planet Mercury. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Japan has successfully deployed two lander rovers onto the surface of the asteroid Ryugu. The tiny robotic rovers Minerva 21A and Minerva 21B were housed inside a drum shaped descent module, which was jettisoned from the Hayabusa 2 orbiter towards the asteroid's boulder strewn surface. The one kilogram rovers were then released from their canister at an altitude of about 60 metres and allowed to fall independently to the ground. Each rover is equipped with a wide angle and stereo camera and a scientific instruments package. The asteroid Ryugu is only about 950 metres across, so it has extremely low mass and hence low gravity. And that's a problem because the Japanese Space Exploration Agency, JAXA, didn't want a repeat of what happened to the European Space Agency's Rosetta mission. Rosetta failed to properly place its lander Philae onto the surface of the comet 67P Sheremov Gerasimenko. Instead of staying put on the comet's surface, using a small push rocket motor mounted on the lander's roof, combined with anchoring harpoons and spears in the lander's legs, Philae rebounded back up at least a kilometre into space, before bouncing at least once more, and finally coming to rest upside down in a dark ditch. The hockey puck-shaped Minerva 2, 1A and B are instead designed to hop and float across the asteroid's blackish-coloured surface using internal rotors. Glenn Nagel from NASA's Deep Space Communications Complex in Canberra says the American Space Agency has been supporting the Hayabusa 2 mission since its launch in December 2014. So our CSRO managed station here in Canberra, part of NASA's Deep Space Network, has been providing part of the communication support for the Hayabusa 2 mission since its launch in 2014. And right throughout its journey to actually get to asteroid Ryugu in the first place. And of course, over the last uh, few days and hours, been supporting the spacecraft as it landed the first two or four rovers on the surface of the asteroid. They have successful contact with both of the spacecraft. And the next big event, I guess, comes on the 3rd of October when the mascot rover touches down. Yes, it's certainly the, the plan for early October to set down mascot, a much larger rover than previously with the two sort of almost biscuit tin sized Minerva spacecraft. And there's also the Minerva 2-2 rover yet to land as well, the fourth of these rovers. Yeah, so that may look sometime into 2019. So part of the ongoing planning of the mission will be to look for other landing sites where they can place these quite dynamic little vehicles that are going to sort of fling themselves about in the incredibly low gravity of the asteroid, 60,000 times weaker than our own planet's gravity. Of course, that's been a big problem in the past, hasn't it? I mean, you only have to think back to the Rosetta mission from the European Space Agency, where gravity played a, let's face it, not insignificant role in in Philae's failure to be able to anchor itself and, and stay on the ground when it got there. Yeah, landing on these very small worlds is very difficult. I mean, the shape of them means that gravity is pulling in multiple directions. Uh, the gravity, of course, is incredibly low. The surface themselves is not sort of a nice solid ground like we think here. It's really a jumbled collection of rocks and dirty material. So you do not know what you're going to find. And certainly the Hayabusa team... They've got a lot of experience that they can call on. Their first mission, Hayabusa 1, deployed rovers that actually missed the asteroid that they were aiming for. So they've gone to a lot of extra care to take those lessons of the past and make sure that they get a successful touchdown with these first of these four rovers. Of course, the spacecraft itself has got to land and take its own samples from the surface of the asteroid and then eventually return those to Earth, uh, landing them out in the desert. So it's going to be quite interesting, this information that gets returned from the spacecraft over the next few years so we can really understand much more about the characteristics of asteroids and their story about the solar system, life in the solar system, and even their potential threat to planet Earth. That's the CSIRO's Glenn Nagel from NASA's Deep Space Communications Complex in Canberra. The Hayabusa 2 spacecraft will deploy two more rovers, another small rover, the Minerva 2-2, 
and the mission's primary lander, a 10kg mascot rover, which will touch down on October the 3rd. Mascot carries an infrared spectrometer, a magnetometer, a radiometer and a camera to image the small-scale structure, distribution and texture of the regolith. It's designed to move across the surface by tumbling to reposition itself for further measurements. The Hayabusa 2 mission launched on a Japanese H-2A rocket from the Tanegashima Space Center south of Tokyo, arriving at Ryugu in June. In all, the spacecraft will spend 18 months studying the asteroid's chemical composition, its structure, its early history and evolution. The 609kg spacecrafts carry multiple scientific payload instruments designed for remote sensing and sampling. These include optical navigation cameras, a near-infrared spectrometer, a LiDAR light detection and ranging instrument, a thermal infrared imager and laser rangefinders. The three small rover landers are known as Minerva 2s because there was a Minerva 1, and as you'd expect it flew aboard the original Hayabusa mission, Japan's first asteroid sampling mission. It returned samples from the asteroid Itakawa, parachuting them down into the Woomera rocket range in outback South Australia in 2010. After studying Ryugu for a year and a half, Hayabusa 2 is slated to depart the asteroid in December 2019, and its samples will also be parachuting back into the Woomera rocket range with the expected arrival in December 2020. 162173 Ryugu is a potentially hazardous near or near-Earth object. It's part of what are known as the Apollo group of Earth-crossing asteroids. The diamond-shaped space rock is a rare type of asteroid known as a spectral type CG, which includes properties of both common carbonaceous or high-carbon C-type asteroids and relatively rare G-type asteroids. These contain strong ultraviolet absorption lines suggesting phyllosilicate minerals such as clays and mica. Thanks to Hayabusa 2, we now know that Ryugu rotates on its axis every 7.5 hours. It orbits the Sun in retrograde, that is opposite to the way the planets orbit the Sun, taking 474 Earth days to complete each Ryugu year. Its orbit takes it from 0.96 up to 1.41 astronomical units, an astronomical unit being the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, about 150 million kilometres or 8.3 light minutes. Jonty Horner from the University of Southern Queensland says the Hayabusa 2 mission will help astronomers understand not just how Ryugu formed, but how our whole solar system evolved. I'm absolutely buzzed about it, to be honest. It's a really exciting mission, and not just because of the science involved. I mean, the science is really cool in and of itself, but it's such an incredible technological achievement as well. And I think it's one of these things that the Japanese Space Agency has always undersold almost what it did with the initial Hayabusa mission a few years ago, which brought back samples from an asteroid for the very first time but didn't quite do it right. And this is a follow-up which is bigger, better, stronger, faster, doing everything better. And it's astonishing. We've been able to launch this spacecraft while the Japanese Space Agency has, fly around, get to this asteroid, go into orbit around it, spend a couple of months mapping it out, measuring it, learning all about it, then going up and dropping two little kangaroo-like rovers that are hopping around the surface. And we're not even halfway through the mission yet. There's a lot of other cool stuff to come. It's just pretty breathtaking, really. Four rovers in total. Um, mascot is the big one. So the Minerva 2 1A and 1B and Minerva 2 number 2 are each around 1 kilo in size, and Mascot is about 10 kilos. That's a really chunky one. And they are learning more about this asteroid. They're going to do cute little things like trying to pick up if there's dust floating around near the asteroid by using little LED lights on the rover, shining them up and seeing if you get light scattered back, essentially. They're going to do all these cute little things, and all of it, of course, is preparation for the sample return, which is a really big part of it. Well, even now, the science coming back is already pretty spectacular. We know this asteroid's very black in colour. Yeah, it's remarkable. And to some degree, that's not that unexpected. I did my PhD a very long time ago looking at objects called the Centaurs, which are icy objects in the outer solar system that are kind of the parents of the short-period comets we see. And they are remarkably low albedo. They're very low reflectivity. They're blacker than a blackboard, essentially. Cometary and nuclei are the same. And... This asteroid, Ryugu, is what we call a carbonaceous asteroid. It's very, very primitive, so it's probably got a lot in common with those cometary nuclei. may even have buried deep within it 
water volatile material still. There's no guarantee that it's necessarily rock all the way through. And the dark colour is not necessarily unexpected for an object like that. Well, of course, also there have been some hints of clays there as well, which would further go towards that idea of some water. It would, and that wouldn't be a huge surprise. I mean, one of the things that I think we often misunderstand, we miss here, is this idea that the universe is dry. The universe is wet, there's water everywhere. It's liquid water that's relatively unusual. If you think about water, it's hydrogen plus oxygen. Hydrogen is the most common atom there is. It's 75% of everything. Oxygen is the third most common atom there is. And if you put them together, you get water. So water, the molecule, is abundant through the cosmos. It's everywhere. The reason we don't get much liquid water is that the conditions for liquid water are quite narrow compared to all the conditions you could possibly have. So there's a lot of water ice out there, but not much liquid water. What something like clays would tell you is that in the history of Ryugu, perhaps on the parent body that it was ejected from in a collision in the past, the conditions were right at some point for there to be liquid water, either on the surface or possibly more likely buried deep within the interior under temperature and pressure from overlaying rock. But it's really interesting that we're learning all this stuff about it because if you think 15, 20 years ago, before we started visiting these objects, we didn't have any idea how diverse they'd be, how varied they'd be, or for that matter, just how spectacular and cool they'd be. What will Ryugu tell us about the evolution of the solar system? It has the potential to tell us a great deal. So we can learn a fair amount about objects and the solar system and all the rest of it just by looking at objects from a distance. But when we're doing that, we're playing a detective story. It's what astronomers usually do. We observe something from a distance, and that's a clue to the narrative that's happened to get us to this point. But we can learn a huge amount more if we actually have material that we can bring into a lab and we can do experiments on, we can do dating of, we can do isotopic analysis of. All these things allow us to study things in much more depth. And I guess it's a difference between, I guess, in the detective analogy, having, looking from a great distance, been a detective 100 years ago trying to look into who Jack the Ripper was or something like this, whereas bringing materials back and studying in the lab is like modern forensic work. It's that level of difference. And so by being able to bring back pieces of this asteroid, by learning about the asteroid and knowing where it came from, that will put it as a jigsaw piece in this narrative of how the solar system formed. We'll get ideas of what the most primitive objects are like, whereabouts in the solar system they formed, how wet or otherwise it is. All these kind of questions play into that story that helps us to disentangle the story of how Ryugu formed, but also the story of how the planets formed, how the Earth came to get its water, things like this. So it really is very, very exciting work. That's John T. Horner from the University of Southern Queensland. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The mystery of the strange pyramid-shaped mountain Ahuna Mons on the dwarf planet Ceres may finally have been solved. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, indicates the five-kilometre-high ice volcano rises in solitude over its barren, flat surroundings because of its youth. Ahuna Mons' solitary position above the plains of Ceres presented a mystery which has fascinated both scientists and UFO believers ever since its discovery by NASA's Dawn spacecraft in 2015. The mountain is at most 200 million years old, meaning that, though no longer erupting, it was active in the very recent geological past. The study's lead author, Michael Sori from the University of Arizona, theorised that evidence of older volcanoes on the dwarf planet had been erased over time by a natural process called viscous relaxation. You see, viscous materials like honey or putty can begin as a thick blob, but the weight of the blob causes it to, over time, ooze into a flatter shape. Surrey says rocks don't do that under normal temperatures and timescales, but ice can. And because Ceres is made of both rock and ice, Surrey and colleagues theorise that formations on the dwarf planet flow and move under their own weight, similar to how glaciers move on Earth. They say a formation's composition and temperature would affect how quickly it relaxes into the surrounding landscape. The more ice in the formation, the faster it flows, but the lower the temperature, the slower it would flow. Ceres is located in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, so its average surface temperature is usually below minus 35 degrees Celsius. But that temperature can vary across its surface. Ceres' poles are so cold that a mountain of ice there will be as hard as rock. In fact, it forms the bedrock, and consequently it wouldn't experience viscous relaxation. 
But at the equator, things can get warm enough that a mountain of ice and rock might relax over geological timescales. And computer simulations showed that Suri's theory was viable. Computer model cryovolcanoes at the poles of Ceres remain frozen in place for eternity. But at other latitudes on the dwarf planet, volcanoes may have begun life tall and steep, but they grew shorter and wider and more rounded as time passed. To find out if the computer simulations played out in reality, the authors examined topographical observations taken by the Dawn spacecraft to find landforms that match their models. Across the 1.6 million square kilometres of Serean surface, they found 22 mountains, including Anua Mons, that looked exactly like the simulation's predictions. Amazingly, they found only one mountain at the pole, and it was old and battered by impacts, just as the simulations predicted it would be. The polar mountain, named Jamor Mons, also has the same overall shape as Anua Mons. It's fairly tall compared to its width, giving it an aspect ratio of 0.2. But mountains found elsewhere on Ceres have far lower aspect ratios, meaning they're much wider than what they are tall, just as the models predicted. By matching the real mountains to the models, the authors were able to determine the age of many of them. The volume of the volcanoes was estimated by studying their topography. And by combining age and volume, Suri and colleagues were able to calculate the rate at which cryovolcanoes form on Ceres. These new calculations represent the first time that scientists have been able to precisely determine cryovolcanic activity from direct observations. They found a new volcano forms on Ceres roughly every 50 million years. This equates to an average of more than 13,000 cubic metres of cryovolcanic material each Earth year. And that's far less volcanic activity than what's seen here on Earth, where rocky volcanoes generate well over a billion cubic metres of material a year. As well as being less productive, volcanic eruptions on Ceres are also tamer than those on Earth. Instead of explosive eruptions, it seems cryovolcanoes can create the icy equivalent of lava domes. The cryomagma, a salty mix of rocks, ice and other volatiles such as ammonia, oozes out of the volcano and freezes on the surface. The causes of cryovolcanic eruptions on Ceres are still a mystery. But future research might yield answers as signs of ice volcanoes have been found on numerous other bodies in the solar system. Ceres, however, is the first cryovolcanic body a mission has orbited. But future missions are planned for the Jovian ice moon Europa and the Saturnian ice moon Enceladus, both of which are also likely candidates for cryovolcanism. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. It's all systems go for Europe's first mission to the planet Mercury. The Bepi Colombo spacecraft's two science orbiters have now been connected in their launch configuration, and the European Science Orbiter and Transport Module is being loaded with propellants. The mission's now completed its qualification acceptance review, which confirms it's on track for launch on October the 19th aboard an Ariane 5 rocket from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana. That launch window will remain open until November 29. Following the successful fueling readiness review, the chemical propellants, primarily hydrazine, were added to the European Mercury Transfer Module and the Mercury Planetary Orbiter. With fueling activities now complete, a technical point of no return has been reached. After mechanical stacking, final electrical health check and transfer to the final assembly building, the launch is the next major event. These final weeks will see the spacecraft stack placed inside the Ariane 5 launch vehicle's payload fairing. And there's the preparations for the launch vehicle itself, ready for blast-off on what will be a seven-year journey around the inner solar system to investigate Mercury's mysteries. The Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency JAXA is providing the Mercury Magnetospheric Orbiter. The Mercury Magnetospheric Orbiter's main science goals will be to provide a detailed study of the magnetic environment of Mercury, the interaction of the solar wind with the planet, and the diverse chemical species present in the exosphere, the planet's extremely tenuous atmosphere. The European Space Agency is providing the Mercury Transfer Module, the Mercury Planet Orbiter, as well as the Sun Shield and the Interface Structure. The Mercury Planetary Orbiter will focus more on surface processes and composition, and together with the Mercury Magnetospheric Orbiter will help piece together the full picture of the interaction of the solar wind on the planet's environment and surface. Together, they'll watch how this interaction at the surface feeds back into what's observed in the exosphere, and how that varies both in time and location, 
something which can only be achieved with two spacecraft in such complementary orbits. For the launch, the stack will be based around the Mercury transfer module being placed at the bottom, attached to which will be the Mercury planetary orbiter, followed by the Mercury magnetospheric orbiter, which will have the Sun shield attached to it for the seven-year journey to the planet. The Mercury transfer module will use both ion propulsion and chemical propulsion engines in combination with nine gravity assist flybys of the Earth, Venus and Mercury to bring the two science orbiters close enough to Mercury to be gravitationally captured into its orbit. Bepi Colombo will fly around Earth once, around Venus twice and do six gravity assist flybys of Mercury before finally entering orbit. By the way, that name Bepi Colombo well, that's the name of Giuseppe Beppe Colombo, the Italian scientist, mathematician and engineer who first implemented the idea of interplanetary gravity assist manoeuvres. That was way back in 1974 during NASA's Mariner 10 mission. Once Mercury orbit insertion has been achieved, the Mercury planetary orbiter will use its small thrusters to deliver JAXA's Mercury magnetospheric orbiter into its elliptical orbit around the planet before separating and then descending into its own orbit closer to the surface. When Bepi Colombo arrives at Mercury in late 2025, it'll endure temperatures in excess of 350 degrees Celsius, protected by its special heat shield. It'll gather data during its initial one-year nominal mission, with a possible one-year extension after that. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. China's carried out a surprise launch of a new marine observation satellite, the Haiyang-1C was launched into a 780-kilometre-high sun-synchronous orbit aboard a Long March 2C rocket from the Taiwan Satellite Launch Centre in Shanxi Province. The official China Xinhua News Agency says the 442-kilogram satellite uses a medium-resolution optical imager and temperature scanner, as well as a multispectral pushroom CCD instrument to monitor suspended sediment concentrations and dissolved organic matter in the ocean, which can affect sea colour as well as sea surface temperatures. The spacecraft will operate for the next five years, providing data to help estimate fishery resources. The flight was the 284th launch of a Long March series rocket and China's 24th orbital mission this year. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. New figures from the World Health Organization show that Australians drink almost twice the global average alcohol intake. The 2018 Global Status Report on Alcohol and Health shows that alcohol consumption is responsible for around 3 million, that's 7.2% of all premature deaths worldwide. And that figure goes up to 13.5% for young people. The study shows Australians drink an average of 10.6 litres of pure alcohol each year, much higher than the global average of 6.4 litres. Australia also has high levels of heavy episodic or binge drinking, especially in 15 to 19 year olds where this type of drinking is any more than half of all drinkers. Mind you, Australia isn't the worst. In France, the average person consumes more than 12 litres of pure alcohol a year, while in Russia, the average is around 11.7 litres. Researchers with the Australian National University have discovered one of the holy grails of paleontology, evidence of the earliest known animal. The 558-million-year-old fossil, known as Dixonia, was discovered in a remote area near the White Sea in northwestern Russia. A report in the journal Science claims the ancient creature was so well preserved that its tissues still contained molecules of cholesterol, a type of fat that's a hallmark of animal life. The strange 1.4-metre-long oval-shaped animal is composed of rib-like segments running along its body. Scientists still don't know whether it has a mouth. Dixonia is part of the Ediacara biota, which lived on Earth some 20 million years before the Cambrium explosion of modern animal life. The Cambrium explosion was when complex animals and other macroscopic organisms, such as mollusks, worms, arthropods and sponges, began to dominate the fossil record. Scientists have been fighting for more than 75 years over what Dixonia and other bizarre-looking fossils of the Ediacaran biota were, giant single-celled amoeba, lichen, failed experiments of evolution, or the earliest animals on Earth. The fossil fat molecules paleontologists found now confirm Dixonia as the oldest known animal fossil, proof that animals were large and abundant 558 million years ago, millions of years earlier than previously thought. 
Australian and American marine archaeologists believe they may have finally uncovered the final resting place of Captain James Cook's ship, the HMS Endeavour. The ship was commanded by Cook on his mission of discovery and science to observe the transit of Venus and then explore and map the east coast of a long-rumoured giant land, Terra Australis, now known as Australia, and claiming it in 1770 for Mother England, much to the detriment of the land's original Aboriginal owners. Battered and badly damaged following its voyage of discovery, Endeavour was sold off and renamed Lord Sandwich II. It was discovered in Newport Harbour, Rhode Island, where it had been scuttled in 1778 by the British as part of a blockade during the American War of Independence. It's believed to be lying in just five metres of water deep in mud just north of Goat Island. In a classic Who Funded This Study, US scientists have given ecstasy to a species of solitary asocial octopus and then watched as the critters got all touchy-feely with one another. The stone cephalopods were seen to spend lots of time interacting and even made extensions of physical contact all while eating. The findings, reported in the journal Current Biology, show that even though octopus and humans are separated by more than 500 million years of evolution, a bit of MDMA shows they share similar systems that enable the neurotransmitter serotonin to encode social behaviour, something scientists had suspected after sequencing octopus genes. Microsoft has confirmed it will keep supporting its Windows 7 operating system, but it will cost Windows 7 users. With the details, we're joined by Alex Zahar of Reut from IT Wire. Yeah, it's nearly 10 years old. It launched on the 22nd of July 2009. And for some people, they just prefer it because it didn't have any of the more radical touchscreen elements of Windows 8. It still had the traditional start menu that people really liked. And in Windows 10, you know, a lot of people didn't like the fact that it had the radical new start menu that took some getting used to. If you wanted to put the old start menu back, there were programs that you could use to do that, but they needed updating on a regular basis. And there are just some people who still love Windows 7 and plenty of businesses for whom this uh, life cycle upgrade we're going to talk about in a moment, they're stuck on it because they like to upgrade at a much slower pace. It's expensive for them to upgrade software, hardware, and get people to learn new ways of doing things. Okay, you were mentioning a life cycle upgrade. What's that all about? Microsoft was originally going to stop all updates on the 14th of January 2020. But what they're going to do is allow businesses who are using a specific version of Windows 7 with uh, you know, the enterprise or professional version, they can buy a new license that allows them to continue getting updates for the next three years after 2020. But they will charge an increasing amount per year for that to happen. And there's no specifics on how much it'll be, but the rumor is that it'll be around about 75% of the cost of buying Windows for the first year. So it's going to be an expensive proposition and companies will basically be are being urged to upgrade to Windows 10 to save all that money. And why spend the money on software when you can spend it on um, new hardware or new versions of, of um, other more important software than Windows? Why does one have to update software for an operating system which has been around for so long? Why wouldn't it just work all the time anyway? Well, it will work all the time. But the problem is that there are new vulnerabilities discovered on a regular basis, ways that hackers can get in to take control of your computer and to do things that you don't want them to do. And so if you don't update your operating system, one day you, you could just visit a website or somebody could try and visit your computer through your router over the internet using some sort of hacking tools and they could just get in. And it's like somebody having a master skeleton key to your house. If they could get in, they could rifle through all of your stuff. It's not like you could buy a radio in the old days, turn it on, and it would work. With software, there are always loopholes, always things that can be worked around, and updates are the only way to stay protected as well as protective software. But isn't that why you buy uh, antivirus uh, software? Sure, but antivirus software can't protect you from every scenario. And the bad guys are always trying to find ways that even antivirus software can protect you from whether it's buffer overruns through certain commands or you know something hidden in a in a picture whatever it might be there's there's ways and means to get around those sort of protections in fact there's even zero day vulnerabilities these are things that have no update or protection at all and we've heard about how government spy agencies have used these as well as just bad guys to break into people's computers and you know there's no protection from that at all except turning your computer off so to stay protected you need to have updates and when microsoft decides to stop issuing up for an operating system, it will become dangerous, more and more dangerous to use that system every day. That's Alex Sahara of Reut from IT Wire. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. 
You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 